<laughs> you don't use that on any Get Your Gun, do you? Yes, to, yeah. to call the children on, yeah. Yeah, so yeah. how's the show doing? It's going fantastic. Yeah, you've got marvelous crits for it. Yeah, I'm really, really pleased. Thank you, you very were, much. You were here before with this. I mean, but uh, obviously the musical is the big thing in the West End now, but that's, it's an old musical. I mean, would the audience be as old as they are with us this evening? <laughs> How many people remember it? You remember it. Not the way we sung it, you don't. No. Really. No. <laughs> Speak for yourself, Terry. Yeah. Do you remember the last interview we did? Yes. Yeah. Let's have a look at that, yes. because you gave us an example of shooting at its best there. Yes. Right, that was just... You see that rooster's head off there? All right. Now you don't. <laughs> yeah. 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 Yeah, is the shooting any better than it was now? Because I noticed during that, you went, kick. And then about 10 seconds later, there was a bang. Well, I wonder why that could have happened. <laughs> <laughs> that happened on stage as well. It, a couple of times that's happened. In fact, the, one of the very first shows we did, the gun didn't go off at all. I went click, and I'm supposed to shoot the rooster's head, and it went click. And so I just said, bang, and nothing happened. It's supposed to turn around. So I said, bang. And at that point, the actor with me, Barrick, was just on the floor laughing. And I just turned, and I said, Say your next line, boy. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're going to sing a, a song from the show for us. Yes, I am. Okay, Miss Susie Quattro, we're going to sing from Annie. Yeah. Get you going. Yeah. Yeah. All right. It's that little old crowd pleaser from Annie. Get you going. But Susie Quattro is Annie Oakley, and you can't get a man with a gun. Frightened by a shotgun, they say That's why I'm such a wonderful shot I'd be out in the cactus And I'd practice all day And now tell me what have I got I'm quick on the trigger With targets not much bigger than a I'm number one But my score with a feller Is lower than a seller Oh, you can't get a man with a gun When I'm with a pistol I sparkle like a crystal Yes, I shine like the morning sun But I lose all my luster Buster. Oh, you can't get a man with a gun With a gun, with a gun No, you can't get a man with a gun If I went to battle with someone's herd of cattle You'd have stayed when the job was done But if I shot the herder, they'd holler bloody murder There, dang my britches and other expressions of corn pone delight. I don't know what brought on all that, really, apart from the fact that it has absolutely nothing to do with the royal wedding, nor the Commonwealth Games, 
which is more than you can say for two of my guests tonight. And the other one is the South African, so don't say we're not topical. The South African is currently topping the bestseller lists with his, his latest thud and blunder epic. His name is Wilbur Smith. And the royal connection tonight comes from one of that fine body of men who see it as their duty to the British public to dog the royal's footsteps from Australia to Ascot, from Balmoral to Brunei. And he'll be there on the big day with his aluminium ladder and his long-range lens. That's the son's royal photographer, Arthur Edwards. And we'll be hearing and reading even more about Fergie's hips and Andy's scarlet past, or we would be if it wasn't for the Commonwealth fracas and the almost daily diminution of what, up to only two weeks ago, was being called the friendly games. So let's meet a man whose credentials for commenting and commentating on the games are impeccable. Welcome someone you'll be seeing and hearing a lot of in the next couple of weeks, Ron Pickering. Are you, are you, even as we speak, getting yourself ready for the commentating, giving yourself for fast talking? Oh yeah, gearing up, absolutely. One has to do that. You know, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. What? It's also about the Commonwealth, though. It's, it's, you know, it's when the Russians and the Poles get together and the names tend to get a bit twisted. But, yes, uh, you you've got names you can handle. Though, mind you, now that so many black nations are out of the Commonwealth Games, it's going to be even easier for you, isn't it? Well, it is. Uh, but there are 25 countries. Let's, let's be fair. It's still going to be a wonderful Commonwealth Games. It's a larger Commonwealth Games than most Commonwealth Games. It's going to be a tremendous party. It's just sad that so many fine athletes will not be there. Yeah. As, as for commentary, I mean... Commentators get a tremendous amount of stick, almost as much as chat show hosts. <laughs> Especially at Christmas. Yeah, well, any time of the year. But they do, and, and I think in a sense it's rather unfair, because particularly as far as athletics are concerned, and it's a 100 metres dash or something like that, you've got about less than 10 seconds to commentate on what's happening, and you're likely to say anything in the excitement, aren't you? And generally do, yeah. And generally do. First day of the Olympic Games, it's, it's David Coleman and I shuffling the cards to see who's going to take the first bite of the first heat. And there's like 40 languages and 150 people you've never seen. And, you know, he's, he's likely to say, have you seen them I've got in lane one? You know, it's, um, it's uh, the Greek. And you say, which Greek? And he says, Vasilio Papagiogopoulos. And you say, great. Yeah, yeah well, he's next to the Madagascar. <laughs> Jean-Louis Ravlio Menantzoa. And you've got eight other guys in the race and it's ten and a half seconds. So, yeah. It's, uh, you know. Incidentally, I hope you're making yourself <clears throat> heard. If you're wondering what that incessant drumming is going on. It's the rain. It's a summer shower on Shepherd's Bush Green. <laughs> Indeed. And I thought for a minute, listening to it, that great heavens, the BBC are spending money, they've turned on the air conditioning. <laughs> but not so. The same thing happened last year, Ron. <laughs> and the BBC again, to whom every expense is spared, <laughs> it came through the roof. So if it does come through the roof tonight and we all get electrocuted, at least you'll see some live deaths on the show. <laughs> so, Terry, I think they've heard you and it's stopped. <laughs> no, no, it's coming down in bucketfuls. Our audience are glad to be in out of the rain anyway, aren't you? Yeah. 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 May not be a great show, but at least you're in out of the rain. Mm. Yeah. So, what, <clears throat> what gaffes do you, oh. do you, are you responsible for? I mean, be honest. What, well, what? I started the whole Coleman Boys column in Private Eye, and, and sadly, David Coleman's been lumbered with it forever. I was the guy that said, it's the giant Cuban Juan Torino who opens up his legs to show his class. Now, that's mine. That's, I mean, I've, I've got some others, lots of Good others. Good old Coleman always got the yeah, blame he for got that, it. He, he? Got, yeah. and he Actually, uh, he sought the tape out yeah. just to prove that. And now we can't find the tape. We think he's burned he's it. He's had it destroyed, not yeah. But that was mine, yeah. And, uh, and in a gymnastic session once, I, I once said, look at her feet, a perfect extension of her legs, which I thought was very reasonable <laughs> at the time. <laughs> I mean, I thought at very the time, yeah. just, at the time, oh, in the excitement yeah. of the moment, you, you wouldn't have noticed to no, go no, by. No, and I generally say, up and down like a metronome. I mean, that's another of mine as well. <laughs> <laughs> but so, when you uh, up and down like a metronome, yeah. Yeah. when you have a, when you when you do make a gaff of the yeah. first magnitude and you are conscious of it, what what do you do? Do you try and apologise for it, or, or do you just carry on? Well, the awful thing is that someone in VT whispers in your ear, thanks a lot, Ron, we use that at Christmas. I mean, you know you've done it, or you're already sweated, because you, you know. I mean, it just, you, you twig almost immediately that yeah. uh, you've blown it. But obviously, you're, you're steeped in athletics, you're steeped in, uh -huh. in sport, and so you love taking part and commentating on, on You've just come back from the World Student Games in Athens. World Junior Championship, the junior first championship. ever. Terrific, too. 146 countries, no politicians there, no boycotts, no problems. Terrific athletics. Yes. But that's obviously meat and drink to you. But, but what is, what's really tough 
to, to commentate on? Oh, I, I find a lot of sports. I mean, Murray Walker frightens me to death every Saturday, and I love the guy. I think he's absolutely terrific. But it's, uh, it's when he starts screaming things like, he's fighting his bucking bike. I think there's no way that I can survive in this business. <laughs> Spoonerism is going to be my problem. And so I get worried about that. And, yeah. uh, and there are a lot of, um, and I couldn't do the slow cricket. I mean, I think they write their script before they go on. I really do. Yeah. I mean, I think that someone who says, uh, the batsman's holding, the bowler's willy. I think he wrote that. <laughs> and he waited for the situation to occur. Now, in athletics, you don't get that chance. You know, you're just living on your wit's end all the time. Yeah, well, of course, in cricket, particularly on the radio, those Radio 3 commentators, old blowers and Johnners and all sure, those people, sure. I mean, they, they start describing the bosses going by <laughs> the end of the road. And <laughs> Eating their plum cake, making yeah, exactly. daisy chains. Yes, ours is a different business. Yeah. Well, now, what about the Commonwealth Games? The, mm. the current update, I think, is, when I last saw it, 26 countries Away. have now pulled out. Is it going to invalidate the games? Well, I hope not, because uh, there's still 25 countries there. They are determined to make them work. The, the, the Scots have done a fantastic job in organizing them. If anyone remembers back in 1970, they did it then. And I think the, uh, you know, the closing uh, refrain of, will you know, come back again, it's always been a promise. And they will lay on a marvellous game. So I just, uh, I just hope that uh, the rot stops, because boycotts are not going to help But anyway. they're going to lose a lot of money whenever happens oh, sure. now. I mean, sure. I saw Robert Maxwell on the 6 o'clock news say that he was going to sue the countries who hadn't turned up or, or boycotted for a couple of million. Well, I, I, don't, I wish him joy trying to get He's money out of those people. <laughs> It's like asking for the world debt to be retained, you know, I mean, repaid. It's not going to happen like that. No, I think it's sad. And, uh, and he's brought a bit of financial power to the organization, and I think it needed it at the time. But it's still going to be a great game. So there's no doubt about it. It's going to be a great game. Well, when, when was the last non-political games? The 1983 World Championships in Helsinki. Because the Olympic Games have become a platform, for all those that wanted it. I mean, if you want to make a statement around the world, Terry, for heaven's sake, there's half the world's population going to watch the Olympic Games. If you're a terrorist or if you're a politician that wants to use sport, as many politicians do, the time to do it is at a major championships. Now, they've used uh, the Commonwealth Games in this way. They missed out on the kids, although there are 146 countries there. There were Jews and Arabs and there were Greeks and Turks and there are, there are Russians and Americans. There's everybody there. Uh, and they haven't used the games. They, and it's keeping the politicians out of the games that's the problem. Some athletes have suggested that if it was all straightforwardly professional, then rather like Wimbledon, national considerations wouldn't come into it. I don't think that can work. Sadly, you see, if uh, I think the, the athletes concerned are our best athletes and they want to protect what's going well. But the, you know, uh, the, the, we've got five millionaires in British athletics and 55,000 paupers, and there's a huge gap between them. We've got kids who can't afford to train twice a day. Now, if we start going professional, what about the what about all the th hundreds of thousands of officials that do it all for nothing, for love? I mean, that is really the basis of amateur sport. It's about the love of sport and a care for sport and about its origins and its ethics. And if we suddenly say we're going to go professional and we're going to pay ridiculous fees as they do in tennis and golf or whatever, uh, athletics will be bankrupt in about three weeks. You've got a personal interest in the games. Your son is going. Yes, he is. Representing Wales. Yes, he is. Yes. Uh, and uh, his mother will be going up to see him. He's just returned from an American university. We don't expect him to break uh, any records, but he does hold the Welsh record for the three throws, and it'll be it'll, it'll be interesting commentating on one son, yeah. following in his mother's footsteps rather than mine. I hasten to it's going to be as difficult as I remember Peter Su Peter O'Sullivan used to find commentating on a race in which one of his horses was running. That's right. But he, man right. he managed to do it. I'm sure you will. Yeah. We wish your son and you the best of luck, and we wish the games the best of luck. Indeed. Too, Let's hope they survive the boycotts. Thanks a lot. Thank Terry, you, Ron. Nice to talk to you. Thank you. Well, it's going, to be, it's going to be a busy couple of weeks for Ron, but, but this week could be a lifetime for my next guest. The royal wedding's been claiming everybody's attention for some time, but for Fleet Street, or Wapping, it's become a circus, a relentless, obsessive chase for pictures and articles, fact and fiction, as everything and anything you never wanted to know about Fergie and Andy is regurgitated for your delight. Now, what, whatever they're going to fill the papers with next week, doubtless pictures of the wedding, and the secret honeymoon hideaway, taken more likely than not by my next guest, the son's ace lensman, Arthur Edwards. <laughs> now, Arthur, it's a big day 
for F Fergie and I. It's almost as big a day for you because make or break day, isn't it, next next Wednesday? It is really, especially if, if I... If you don't get the pictures, you're dead. If I don't get the picture of the kiss, I'm dead. And that's the picture I'm going for. The kiss on the balcony? That's right, yeah. So where are you going to be for that? I'm going to be on the Queen Victoria Memorial, as we know in Fleet Street as the wedding cake. Disfiguring the Queen Victoria Memorial, are you? Yeah, that's right, with 30 others. Yeah, so how, how do we recognise a royal photographer? Well, you recognise me because I'll be traipsing down the mall about 6.30 with uh, huge lenses, huge tripod and my aluminium ladder. But are you going to put the aluminium ladder up, up the monument? Uh, it's already there. One of them is, anyway. Yeah. And another one will be coming but, up to it. But how many photographers will be there? There'll be about 30 facing the balcony and but about 30 get, facing the other way. They'll all get the same shot at Well, if you blink, you could miss it. And a lot missed it last time. I wasn't there, but uh, several did miss it last time. Yeah. So are you going to go on honeymoon with them as well? Oh, yeah. I'm off. Off with Windsor Travel. <laughs> Windsor Travel on Thursday. Yeah. You probably get free for giving them the plug there, Arthur. Well, Windsor Travel is a, yeah. is a joke. <laughs> God, I'm very slow tonight. <laughs> the rain has got to me brain, Arthur. How do you think... We, let's have a look at a picture of the, of the Blushing Bride, one of your pictures of Fergie. <laughs> now, that is not the most flattering picture I've ever seen of Sarah Ferguson, Arthur. It's a bit cruel, that, isn't well, it? Well, not really, because she does make pull expressions and does try and give you a different picture. In fact, that was at a Flexworks in Northern Ireland and the smell of the place, you'd uh, pull faces like that. <laughs> How do you think she's shaping up in the, in the short time that she's been under the enormous pressure that you chaps put on her? Well, she's certainly uh, shaping up and shaping down. She's desperately trying to lose weight uh, for the wedding, but she's uh, a lovely, lovely How do you lady. know that, Arthur? Well, because I photographed her in the beginning when she was fat and I photographed her this morning and she was thin. <laughs> I suppose that's a compliment, really, in a way, isn't it? Well, that's a compliment to her, I think. Yeah. She's, uh, she's really looking super. Yeah. Had you been following her before, for a long time before? Had you, had you, with your news hound's nose, worked out that she was going to be Andrew's bride? Uh, when I first saw her at Royal Ascot last year, I didn't think in a million years he would marry her. <laughs> Because before that, he'd been... Uh, Hang on, Arthur, that was a bit dismissive there. <laughs> well, because the, his track record before was always models and actresses, and uh, this girl was a uh, Sloan, and uh, I didn't think it was his scene, but uh, I was told before Christmas, just before Christmas, that not to overlook this girl, she was definitely going to be the one, so I took a huge interest then. Are you implying that, that it, the marriage was somehow arranged, that it wasn't, no, it wasn't not, not necessarily his choice? Oh, no, no, I think he's definitely uh, his choice. Uh, but uh, it was just so different from the other girls he'd been uh, associated with. You think he's decided to settle down? I think he's decided to settle down, and I think he's picked a super lady. In mm. fact, I think he's the lucky one. And is, is there any jealousy between Diana and, and Sarah Ferguson, or is Di still the star of the show? Oh, Di is still the, the number one, yeah. Di is still... Uh, the most uh, beautiful, uh, one of the most beautiful ladies in the world and coupled with the fact that she's going to be the next Queen of England, uh, she's going to be the superstar, I think, for a long, long while. Let's have a look at one of the photographs you took of her. Now that... <laughs> Arthur, do you do this deliberately? No, she does. Now, come on. No, no, no. You're she... going for that unglamorous shot, aren't you? No, 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 that, I think, is a pretty nice picture. I mean, uh, she turned up at a polo match wearing that headscarf and she teased us all afternoon. She walked around with her head down and she turned away. She was giggling. And just before she departed, she gave us that picture. And that is with the Royals. You get one chance. And if you miss it, then it's too bad. And she gave us that picture that day. And I think it's a, I think it's a cracking snap. I'm going to end up in the competition. I think that's a lovely picture. Yeah. But, well, she may not agree with you, but obviously she's a sense of humor. She'll be able to laugh about it. What, what was your first big scoop? Well, believe it or not, it was Prince Charles' bald patch. Feels, there it is up there, yeah. That's a, another one. That's a, another one that's a bit cruel, Arthur. Well, You're I couldn't believe... You're not doing many favours by showing that. <laughs> I couldn't believe it when I saw it either. In fact, I didn't believe it till I saw the print. But uh, when I offered it up the next day uh, and I saw the following morning that it took the place of the Queen, it was on a Jubilee walkabout, I realised, of course, this was the sort of pictures that, that was wanted and not the, you know, the stuffy, boring pictures that we'd been doing up to then. You think that's what the public want? I think so, yeah. I think they want to see something different all the time. And I think that's what I try and do, give the different pictures. But do you think would they want it if you didn't give it to them? 
Well, that's a funny question, Terry. I... <laughs> well, it's a chicken and egg situation. Yeah, exactly. You see, are you creating the demand, or are the public demanding that you show them these pictures? I think a bit of both. I think uh, it's a chicken and egg situation. Uh, we, we've uh, got to get better and better pictures because th that's the standard. And uh, if they're not good, they don't go in the paper. So they've got to be good. Yeah. But it seems that there's much more coverage about the royal family over the last 10 years, and certainly since the last royal wedding. I mean, is that, is that public demand that's creating that, or is it just the papers seeking more and more sensational, sensational photographs, sensational stories about the royal family? I think uh, it changed when Princess Diana came along. I mean, she was such a sort of super beautiful girl, and she was going to, as I say before, going to be the next queen, and that created an enormous amount of interest. And uh, since then, it's got bigger and bigger. Um, the family is getting bigger and bigger. There's William and, uh, and young Harry, and they make great pictures too. Uh, so it's, it's going on and on and on. In fact, uh, when Prince Charles got engaged to Princess Diana, I sent him a telegram congratulating him, and he sent me one back, and it said, uh, thank you for your kind remarks, so I hope you won't be made redundant. <laughs> Do you not think that these kind of pictures, are, uh, and indeed the kind of press attention, it trivializes the royal family, is turning them into a kind of Carrington family of Denver or a Ewing family of Dallas? No, I don't, I don't think so at all. I think we publicize them, sure. But uh, the proof is when they go on these public uh, engagements where the huge crowds turn up, and not only in England, but throughout the world. In, in, I was in Japan recently, and 100,000 people turned up one day. And that was because the pictures that I and my colleagues take are published all over the world, and certainly in Japan. Do you think the royal family welcomed huge crowds, or would they be just happy with the little crowds they used to get before you gave them publicity? I think they love it. They love it. They love the crowds, yeah. They love it all. They're in, in showbiz, fact, are they? They are in showbiz, and I've always said, you don't get any picture that they don't want you to get. They know you're there, and uh, they know what they're giving you. Well, Arthur, I hope you get the kiss. So do I. God, if I don't, I don't know what I'm going to do. You and the, you and the hundred other photographers, we look forward to seeing it on Thursday morning. Well, I hope it's there. Well, I certainly hope it's Have there. a good wedding. Thank you, Terry. Thank you. Thank you. You'll notice I'm on, I'm on the move a lot tonight. You're giving me an opportunity to button and unbutton the blazer. Thank you very much, Arthur. And finally, the most successful adventure writer in the world. His books have sold over 40 million copies worldwide, despite many of them being banned in his own country. He outsells Maclean and Fleming, Higgins and Le Carre, and he currently tops the British bestsellers with his latest paperback, The Burning Shore. Nobody knows what he looks like, so for the first time on British television, welcome Wilbur Smith. So why have you done so few television interviews? Normally, uh, authors are not so reticent, particularly when it comes to selling their books. Well, I'm a writer, not a talker. I'm also a card, and I've got this very funny accent, which... Uh, what accent is that you have, Wilbur? It's a sort of uh, Central African, South African English accent. We won't go into how people get the accents they do, but I mean, it is a strange accent, that South African, isn't it? Yes, it's sort well, of clipped. It's, it's very clipped. It can be. A broad South African is almost unintelligible, but uh, it's the whole spectrum. I like to think I'm out on the outer edge somewhere. Particularly if they're talking Afrikaans. Do you talk That's Afrikaans? Right. Badly. I understand it, but my wife used to teach it. So why do you give so few interviews? Do you think it's not just self-consciousness over the accent, is it? It really becomes that uh, if once you start, it becomes a full-time job, and my job is writing. And I'm a private person. I like to keep things to myself. Um, one of the true reasons, of course, is that I think at about the speed I can write, you know, 15 words a second, uh, 15 words a minute. But you don't think you're fast enough for television? I, no, no, it's, it's, you have to be uh, trained to it, I think, or have the gift of the gab. Some of the people we have on television, they're, ex well, well, but I'm sure it's not the same as South Africa. There are all quick thinkers there. Mm -hmm. But, um, I mean, you don't like television at all, really, do you? I mean, this is, it makes you self-conscious? It not? sets you right in the middle of things. Usually they put the camera. They haven't done it today, I don't think. You never know where they're going to put the camera. You know, on my bald spot or something. Oh, yeah. <laughs> like Prince Charles and me, yes, yes. We've all, anybody who's worth anything has a bald spot, haven't they? And all my most embarrassing moments have been on television. Um, in Australia, where I agreed to go on 
I arrived late, which was a bad thing. My wife was holding the fort for me, and um, the lady that was interviewing her was a very strong woman, uh, pushy woman's rights lady, and yeah. my wife tends to be that way too. So when I finally walked in, the interviewer look, walked, looked up at me and said, Oh, himself has arrived, but I think we don't really need him. And they went on talking. I tried to get a word in, and she said, just hold on, we're talking to the important person here, and what's more, she's better looking than you are. <laughs> so anyway, I made my wife promise she wouldn't butt in this evening, and uh, they've got her upstairs they've got the a, door locked. They've got a strap to the drinks <laughs> now. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's what's happening. Yeah. Do you mix with other writers? Do you, do you all knock about together and... Uh, Pass the old no, ideas around. I, I have some friends who are writers, but the trouble about other writers, they're either more successful than you are, in which case you're jealous of them, so or you're not going to talk to them, no. no. <laughs> and, or, or you are more successful than they, than they are, which is the opposite thing. So there's no exchange, no full and free exchange of ideas at all? No, I think that uh, authors are terrible poachers and they steal each other's ideas. I know this has happened to me on a couple of occasions that I've been silly enough to talk to other writers. But on the other hand, uh, one of my very good friends is a writer, but that's not his main job. His main job is that he is the hereditary witch doctor of the Zulu nation, which uh, makes things a lot more easier for us to get on with. And, you know, he throws the bones for me and um, throws the bones, me throws the bones at you or for you? For me, for me. This is a marvellous thing. He's got this, you know, you think of uh, witch doctor's bones as being like dice in a dice cup. Credo, who's a small man, has to have two assistants to carry his bones. It's about the size of the table, this big leather bag, and it's got bones in there, you know, elephants, hip bones, and all sorts of things. And you really, it's a, it's a major thing to have to chuck these things on the floor and they crash out. And then our credo gets in there and sorts it out and tells you where you're going wrong and what you should do. Is he right quite often? Amazing. Amazing, sometimes incredible. He's picked out things that uh, warned me about situations that I didn't realize I was in at that time. So you believe in witch doctors? I believe that there are powers that I wouldn't snare at and that there are fates and intertwining and that some people have the clairvoyance to be able to pick things out. Have you dealt with these freaks, as it were, in, in any of your books? I, I think very st strongly there is the witchcraft element running through many of my books. Um, the Ballantine series set in Rhodesia, you know, were all around the, the Mlomo, the, the mouthpiece. Some of your books have, have somewhat steamy passages in them, Wilbur. You look, you look a gentleman. I'm not suggesting. I'm not suggesting you're not you're not macho. But when I take these spectacles off, boy, <laughs> <laughs> then it all begins. You should know, You should have the old. You should have the old Hemingway beard, though. If you're going to write these adventure stories, well, mm -hmm. you've got to look like an adventurer. A bottle in one hand and a gun in the other, and a beard. I've tried beards. Yeah, it didn't work out very well because they came out a bit of ginger and a bit of grey and a bit of brown, mm. and the entire well, family too. started laughing at me. You yeah. see, so I had to rush through to the bathroom yeah, I mean, and shave it I, off. When I don't shave for a couple of days, yeah. it comes out grey, Wilbur. Yes. And my moustache is ginger. <laughs> this is exactly what happens to me, you know. Not of this designer fuzz at all. Oh, well, it just looks scruffy. You're just as well to preserve that quiet image, the anonymous image. Anyway, that's a great advantage to being a highly successful writer, isn't it? You've got the fame and fortune and the anonymity. That's exactly right. I mean, you know, uh, some of my friends who are actors and that, they really are prisoners of their own fame. They can't walk in the street without people offering them a fight or a girl coming mm. up and offering them something else. But <laughs> if they recognized you immediately, the girls, if, if they were going by the books and avid readers of your books, they might well make you an offer as well. Because there's fairly steamy passages in there, Wilbur. How can you write that kind of... Is your mother still alive? <laughs> yes, she is, but... How can you write that kind of stuff She your reads those passages alive? with her eyes closed. <laughs> I I've really have often thought, how can you possibly, or anybody, write this kind of stuff, or the steamier stuff, mm. when your mother might read it. Well, you know, I have uh, grandsons, and I just That's watch what they too, get yeah. up to, yeah. you know, and uh, check they out. They let you they're... watch what they get up to. <laughs> <laughs> but I do have this imagination, you know, that yeah. it works. How do they feel? I mean, do they look, because sons, the old man, sons don't think yeah. fathers do anything like that, you know. Where, how, do they speculate how you manage to know all that stuff? 
Well, they haven't actually taxed me with it yet, but I do get a bit of a few sideways looks. What about your wife? Does she does she, uh, she she's, apply the red pencil at all? She's pretty good. She's she's <laughs> there. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> <Not of it. laughs> um, but uh, she's my arbiter of good taste, I must say, and, and some of the things that I do. I, I, occasionally I pull a trick on her, and uh, every day she comes in at, at lunchtime and sits down, and we have a cup of tea, and I give her the day's pages to read. And uh, last year I was, really couldn't start working, so I, I, I read the sort of thing that you get in the... Uh, in the agony column of Hustler magazine or one of these men's magazines, mm. you know, real bodice ripping stuff and panting and mm. and juices and all please, that sort of please. thing. Please, <laughs> please. You, know, you can drive a man insane here. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, she started reading this, and she's pale slightly, and she said, "No, I can't believe this. It's not, it's not happening." No. And you know, it was in the end, she took them, confiscated them, and I've never seen them since. <laughs> Wilbur, thank you for joining us. Continued success as a writer. It's been a pleasure to meet you. Thanks thank very you. much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. That's Wilbur Smith, and that's the holy all of it for tonight. Thank you for your undivided attention. Next Wednesday, of course, you'll be glued to the set from early morning for the Royal Nuptials and Andy and Fergie's big day out. Somewhere among the pomp and circumstance will be your humble servant here. And we'll be having a selective look at the day's grand doings in the distinguished company of Alf Garnet, Ernie Wise, Tracy Ullman, Sue Lawley, Alan Jones will be singing the first performance of the Poet Laureate's poem in order of the Royal Wedding. So see you on the big day, live from Bunting Bedeck, Shepherd's Bush at 7 o'clock. And bring your own champagne. Good night.